Hello Knockouts, Tanya TKO here, and I'm a self-love specialist and relationship expert from TanyaTKO.com. I help you learn how to love yourself and each other. Today we're going to be talking about Surviving R. Kelly, episode 5 and 6. And boy, oh boy, these two episodes were a doozy. Before we jump into that, you know, for those of you who have been following my journey, you know I've been in New York for the past month. And right now I'm at the beautiful YouTube spaces in New York. I just wanted to come here and film before my trip was over. And I um, it, it's bittersweet. You know, it's been so long since I've been here. But nonetheless, so let's jump right into the story. You know, there was some footage that I wanted to show you guys, and I had all of these different things queued up. But by the end of it all, I was just, I, I, I'm just, I'm too fatigued to even go and show the footage. These two episodes were, I'd say, the most emotionally taxing because it teeters on the line of morality. It teeters on the line of legality, and it teeters on the mind of what would you do? And, you know, so there's nobody who knows what a person would do if they were in a particular situation. These two episodes were the episodes where they crossed over into the, the recent allegations. So it starts in 2016 and ends in, um, where does it end? It, it goes all the way into, into reporting on 2018. They started filming the documentary in 2017. And so they get to this point now where everything has come full circle, where they've started the mute R. Kelly, where, they, where they've been discovering the sex cult that he has inside of his homes, his many different homes across the United States. And the girls and the women are of varied ages now. So now in the state of Georgia, the legal age of consent is 16 years old. I looked it up last night. I know, I know. And I wish that we could amend some of these ages of consent to the age gap so that a 16 year old is able to consent to a person who is no more than three years older than her or something along those lines. I mean, come on, because once you start crossing over to 16 and 20, 16, 26, 16, you know, it just starts getting really out of hand. So in this episode, I was really taken all over the place because one of the questions is culpability. Who is responsible for their actions? And last night, you know, when I talked about, when I talked about, look, if a 17, if a 17 year old has decided that this is what she wants to do, that she would rather be in a place where she has to ask to eat, where she's being beat, where she's engaging in, in, in degrading sex acts. So now a 17 year old is still a minor. She's able to consent to, to sex but she still has legal guardians. So once your child, so, this, so there's, there's some gray area there with the legality of consent, but then not the ability to really make legal decisions for herself. You know, so we can talk about that in the comments. But when we start crossing over into 19 year olds, one of the young ladies, look at this. One of the young ladies was 33, her name was Kitty. And then there was another one, Asante McGee. 35 when she met him. <sighs> mm. And so there were a few things, there were, there were some footage that I wanted to show you and the footage that I wanted to show you were of the, the young ladies and the mindset where they were like, they were, they, they were riding hard for R. Kelly. The one young lady, what was her name? The one who was Kitty, who was 35 when she, she quit her job at the, at the radio station. So she was a DJ. She quit her job to go have this tryst and live this life with R. Kelly. She felt that they had a special relationship. She had fallen in love with him. And even she was talking about how, you know, he likes young girls because they're not mentally strong and they can be easily manipulated, etc. However, there are these holes that exist inside of each of us where our esteem can be repaired just a little bit more. And if people are able to, to dig into those little holes and then spread it wider and wider. You know, I made those statements last night about how if your child is of legal age, to, if your child is an adult, 19, 20, et cetera, et cetera, and they're caught up in these situations, and especially if you have other children, 
what is it that you do? So last night I was like, you know, at some point you have to cut your losses and 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 really and and allow your child to make the decisions that they feel are right for them. And you know how I say that everything that we say comes through our own filter? And I guess that comes through my filter because by the time I was 19, my mother was dead. I didn't have the luxury of of not advocating for myself. I didn't have the luxury of putting my destiny into someone else's hands because one, I knew that life was not promised to us. And two, I knew that if I didn't advocate for myself, who would? So there's a part of me that wonders, there's so much. This, these, these last two episodes, I would say, are the least cut and dry because there's so many different canals and so much gray area there. So in this episode, it was really dramatic. This is the episode where Dominique's mother sees her on TMZ. She gets the, the, the crew, because she's filming a documentary with Lifetime, to go out to California. She comes upon the hotel that her daughter is in which if you ask me, it's just too random to be random. You know what I mean? There's something, something else is happening, right? So she comes upon this hotel, she sees her daughter in the room and they go, and it was a really awkward encounter. Her daughter is now looking like a young man and the daughter closes the door in her face because there's this other girl, Jocelyn, that she says Jocelyn is in the room. Her daughter closes the door in her face and then her and her mother, then she calls her mother on the front desk. She's crying. She's like, she wants to meet up with her mom. Then by the time she comes back to meet up with her daughter, um, somebody's called the police on the mother. Then they have to run like runaway slaves out the hotel. It was just, it was just dramatic. They had to meet up in the bathroom. There was no cameras in there. And then they had to run out the hotel arm in arm. And the girl was crying about how difficult it was to leave and how she was happy. She was crying and she was like, she, it's so weird. It's like, there's so much. And then, you know, there were so many flashbacks that I was having, you know, thinking about the way a child traverses through life, how they come into your life as a baby and you have to protect them and do all of this stuff for them. And then they grow and then you send them out into the world to make these decisions. But if there are these holes in their self-esteem, then a person like him can be just like a little dart that darts into that hole and then becomes a grenade that blows that area wide open. But it was good for me to see the part where the daughter truly deep down inside wanted to be saved. But there was something that was stopping her from going. And so this is an opportunity for all of us to take a pause and to realize that we don't know, especially if, if Stockholm Syndrome, these types of things, especially if these things are not our area of expertise, that there may be things that we don't understand. I have never been in an abusive relationship. However, I have met men. I have dated at least one guy who I have the feeling was abusive. However, when it came down to the, the lying, like this gentleman, this man, this male person used to lie about strange things. He was very charismatic, but he also would lie. And the lying felt like abuse to me. And in some ways, lying is. I think before, and then this was the guy I told you about in a video past where he told me some story about how his ex threw a knife at him that hit the the the, the door, the, the you know, the, the frame on the door as he was trying to leave and something happened and he had to punch her in the, and I was just, he punched her in the face, right? And when I heard that story, I was like, and now you know your girl, Tanya. I heard this story and of course, you know, I listened, I listened, I heard the story, I took it in, inside my stomach was churning because I'm like, all of this drama, right? And then you know your girl Tanya, so I had to have a sit down with him and a conversation because to me, there's so many options that we have besides physical violence. There was a part of me, it just didn't sit right in my spirit. But nonetheless, this, this video is not about me, but I say that to say that I'm sure that we all meet abusive people. 
there are certain things that exist inside of all of us that will allow or not allow a situation to get to the next level and then the next level after that and the next level. And the closest thing that I could say of being in a situation where I felt trapped, I would say would be when I lived in South Beach. I lived in South Beach, I don't even know how long it was, anywhere from three to six months. And there was this cycle that existed. And I tell you guys often about that my time in South Beach where I just, where I was hanging out with those girls that was just wilding out. I told you about them the, and the, you know, I told you all about that, but nonetheless, and it was like, there was a progression because I went down there to have fun. And then after a while, it just wasn't fun anymore, but I was caught up in this routine and I really didn't know how it didn't really dawn on me how to get onto the other side of it. Now, there wasn't any uh, abuse from other people in there so much as myself keeping myself in this situation, which then at some point started to feel self-abusive. You know, there were a lot of people who would come in and out of South Beach with a whole consortium, a whole consortium of lies and people just weren't real. They call it the devil's den down there. And it was hard for me to get out of South Beach because I had made the decision to go there. And so you remember how I talked with you all about the promises that we make when we're young. I promise this, I promise that. Sometimes we enter into a decision, just like with some of the girls, they were saying that, um, that they made the decision to go into these relationships. Some of them were also like, well, what would people think of me once I go back? Some of us are in relationships right now. I remember I was caught up in a relationship years ago where I, where people had negative thoughts about the guy that I was dating. Many, this was many, many years ago. And there was a part of me that continued on trying to get onto the, the, the pot at the end of the rainbow part of the relationship so I could be like, see, I told you. Because if I left before that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, then other people could be like, see, we tried to warn you. And so we get caught up in these cycles. And I tell these stories because Though I don't know what it's like to be in a physically abusive relationship. Those who, of you who know my videos and know my story, you know that abuse is a trigger of mine. So I'm not a good candidate to, to be abused because I, I, I just energetically, I revolt against it, right? In past lives, I've lived in ways that will, won't make that part of my dharma in this life. But nonetheless, so... And, 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 and when I, and, and listen, and when we talk about past lives and when we talk about who it is and where it is that we are in this life, right? I'll say this, right? Just like my mother dying created a, a domino effect of, of different things that have happened in my life. The woman that you see here today is a result of all of those things that happened both pleasant and unpleasant in my past, there are no mistakes, right? And so we get to we get to the we get to a situation where we then enter into things that are painful to us in this life, like being a part of this cult, um, being abused by this man, et cetera, et cetera. But there's life after that. As long as you keep living and breathing, putting one foot in front of the other. You come out on the other side of it and those things change you into who it is that maybe there was a part of your soul calling out to be. So on the flip side of that, you know, so it's like, yeah, on the one hand, what can you do? You have a 20 year old who is in this situation. She's having a hard time getting out. However, when she does get out, God willing, they all get out. Who will that person be? How will they be able to contribute then at that point? Because, you know, I can guarantee you once these girls get out of that situation, that will be what it is that they need. That will be what it is that they needed in order to never be in something like that again. You know, and for me, what it is that I saw growing up, the violence that existed in my neighborhood as I came of age made me very sensitive to violence. You know, so that's something that offset, 
But what would have happened if I had never been exposed to that? If I had never had to learn how to fist fight? If I had never, do, do you understand what I'm saying? So it's like, here these girls go and they're traversing. So let's make sure that we go down the list. I, you know, there's one thing that I wanted to say that I thought was remarkable. <laughs> Listen, I can't remember the girl's name. What was her name? I think it was Geronda, but I'm not sure. Who was it? Who was it? She was hungry. <laughs> Listen, they all had a breaking point where they said, you know, no more, no more. For one girl, it was, let's see, for one girl, uh, let's see, she, he was, um, <sighs> you know what, I'll just, I'll just say it, that for one girl, it was, he beat her in the back of the car, and she was like, you know what, this is not something I'm interested in. For another girl who was getting hungry, golly. The girl hadn't eaten for three days, and she said that she was looking at him across the table, and she was thinking of a way to either kill herself or him. Now, that is what I, that is hangry right there. So I can feel her pain, you know, but for everybody, they have a breaking point, and that was hers. For another girl, it was going into the mansion and just seeing how, seeing Jocelyn there and seeing how these girls had to ask for permission to stand and sit and all of this, just, just craziness, right? So I, I wish, I, I would love for all of you to see this, this six part series. It was, it was really, really interesting. It was Kitty. That fool, she was like, mm mm. She was like, she's not gonna. Ah, let's talk about Azriel. This is the biggest and the most controversial part of the documentary. So basically, Azriel met R. Kelly at the concert when she, she was with her parents. Her mother took the father there, her husband, to the R. Kelly concert for his birthday. R. Kelly picked their 17-year-old daughter out of the crowd and um, it was, you know, a lot of girls were on the stage, they were all dancing, but he was like, you know, I knew about his past, but I'm right there, his mother's right, her mother's right there, blah, 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 but the girl had to exit backstage. That's when R. Kelly slipped her his number and then all of this, then they just, it just descended into this whole cat and mouse kind of situation where the daughter was manipulating her parents to make sure that she did things to make sure that she would be able to go with R. Kelly. And so this is the one, this is the situation that is just, is, is, is I don't want to say most frustrating for me, but it's the most morally frustrating for me. Okay. I want to say this and then jump over to talking about this situation. All right. So... She met R. Kelly at a concert that her parents took her to. What does that say to you? She wouldn't have come into contact with R. Kelly if it wasn't for her parents being in the building. So he had gotten the cosign. She, I'm sorry, she had gotten the cosign or he, R. Kelly was cosigned by her parents by even being in that doggone building. Because even though they had heard the rumors or, look, I personally saw the tape. I was done with R. Kelly when I saw the tape. So they heard the rumors, but they didn't know what was true, this, that, and the other. All right, but you still supported his music. You brought your daughter into the building. And so when all was said and done, they pretty much handed their daughter over to R. Kelly. Because he was like, because she was like, this is my career. You guys are messing up my life. She was going to rebel. She was going to do all of this, that, and the other. So her parents were like, okay, but as long as one of us is there, right? Then it turned, then years later, it turned into them giving, per meanwhile, no album dropped. Meanwhile, them giving permission for one of the record label pe women like there ain't madams out there, one of the record label women to be chaperone for her. And then when she turned 18, all bets were off. But this is what I'm saying. They signed documents that it was okay. And it's like they did this because, and remember we talked about children and how some of our children are bullying us. So that, that daughter bullied her parents into allowing for this effery. And so now she's out there, her parents haven't seen her in three years. And my question is, how does anybody know whether she's dead or alive? The, the whole thing just doesn't make any sense. And then, and then, this is the part that I say is the saddest part of all. Her parents were outside the R. Kelly studio in the cold, throwing pebbles at the window. There was a part of me that's like, I, I was just, I was having flashbacks about a movie, seeing them with a big bazooka, blowing it through the front door, or some gunshots, pow, 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 like a gangster movie. But none of that happened. 
It was just them two alone out there, hollering at the window, Mommy and Daddy loves you, we miss you, throwing rocks up there. And I'm thinking to myself, them two alone? Alone are them two? Just standing out there on the cold side of the building with all the doors closed up and the, and the gates on the windows, tossing pebbles up there. And I'm like, you know something? It couldn't have been me. Like how when the, they called the police on that woman in the hotel and they, and, and they were like, if you don't leave the premises, we're going to have to call the police. I'm like, I'm going to call them. We all look, we all going to get arrested today, but we're going to get arrested as I'm, I'm grabbing my daughter from the clutches of this man's palms. Come on. And they standing out there. I'm like, okay, look, police, fire department, every mother effing body, that door's opening. The door's going to open. <sighs> Let me calm down. Let me calm down. But what I'm saying is they're standing out there tossing pebbles and I'm like, Come on. It's like at some point, and the mother's like, I ain't afraid to go to jail. Oh, how come you ain't in jail yet? I just, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. You know, so it's like on the one hand, listen, listen, I, when, when you look, your child is an adult, you know, this, that, and the other. But on the other hand, that is still your child. And I have to think about things where, like, like, let's say it was my egg that I, that I created into this world that was in this building and is possibly harmed. My baby, would that building still be standing today? The thing that upset me the most is that I know how many black people are Christians and all this other stuff. There was no congregation out there with them. If they were Muslim, would the nation of Islam been lined up out? Wait a minute, isn't the nation of Islam stationed in Chicago? Oh me, oh my, oh my. And that building still stands in Chicago. This is the thing, there's so many people that are complicit. So many people that are complicit. And one of the things that kind of stood out to me, <clears throat> R. Kelly sang at Whitney Houston's funeral and the pastor was standing up applauding him because of all of the emotion. And Whitney Houston's funeral was in what year? Ah, oh, Lord. 2012, 2011, something like that. And I'm like, see, cause my notes are, are all over the place. I didn't follow my notes for this video. But the pastors were standing up there applauding him. He had an entry after his footage on that assault tape. And he was still able to come into a church and sing. That's the part that just really just, it just, it just, it just burns my bacon inside. Of all the people who are complicit, speaking of which, Charlemagne the Rapist was in this doggone documentary talking about R. Kelly and the preying on young black girls and how mute R. Kelly needs to usher this man out of there. And I'm thinking to myself, a blood clot, yo. Look at you, who had already admitted to raping his wife for their first encounter, who was, I reported on the Charlemagne the Rapist story in, um, in the summertime, but he raped this girl. He admitted to it. But there was some, uh, there was a reason why he was able to get off. There was something let me, let's talk about it in the comments because we're going to be moving on inside of this video. But uh, what more can I say about this? Oh, last thing that we're going to say is we're going to talk about Oranike and the mute R. Kelly. All right. So black women had to come together. And I remember when the mute R. Kelly came out and people were like, oh, those ladies need to shut up. What are they talking about? They need to give it up, this, that, and the other. Even now, there's still people who are like supportive of R. Kelly. And it wasn't until men started speaking out, just like Beres, what was his name? Hannibal, whatever the guy's name, who had come out in, in um, Hannibal Barris, I believe his name was, who came out against R. Kelly. So it was like women had been speaking up, speaking up, speaking up for years. And then once men started putting their voice on it, 
Just like Chance the Rapper, I believe it was Chance the Rapper, was like, oh, it was a mistake that I made this song with him. So Vince Staples started speaking out against R. Kelly. Then Chance the Rapper was like, oh, I didn't believe those girls because they were black. I made a mistake, blah, blah, blah. So it's like, once again, once again, it took for the very people who created this system of the diminishing of female voices, it took them to come forward to make female voices heard. And it's like, we all are going to have to wake up. And it's like, so women go out there on the front lines, black women go out there on the front lines to once again, save the community. But meanwhile, and so this is the part that really just gets me. So black women laying down with black men each and every day. Meanwhile, these black men are not standing up. What are we doing, ladies? What are we doing that we continue to lay down with men who are not allies and advocating for our freedom, upliftment, and, and empowerment as well? What are we doing? I think that's all that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to leave you all with that. I'm going to leave you all with that and finish off with the father of Azriel talking about a piece of him died when the realization came to him that his daughter was, was able to be sucked into this foolishness, right? Because when someone else's daughter had been victimized by this man, you were like, oh, well, that's their daughter. That you were still willing to allow a person who is a, an accused child predator who's on trial for it, quote unquote, mentor your, your daughter, who is the same age of many of the victims who have spoken out against Kelly. But then let me think. Did we know about all of the other victims between, before 2017, before the whole sex cult thing had come up? Did we know about those victims? Or was it just the, the 2001 incident that we knew about? And then Aaliyah. I think those were the only two things that we knew about up until that point. But for me, that was enough for me. But she says she wanted to have a singing career that he was mentoring her through and her parents supported her in what it is that she said that she wanted. And there's a saying that goes that's like heads that, that can't hear but feel or something like that. If your head can, your hard head makes a soft butt. So I just, I, I, I want to jump into the comments and I want to speak with you all in the comments now that this whole series is over. Maybe I'll do a live broadcast about it as well so that we can talk live. But I wanted to get all of this out so that we can then converse about it because my head is just completely swimming, thinking about all of this madness, all of this madness. One of the things that stood out to me about that family with Azriel is that there was all of this drama of him having them meet at a hotel and then all this and the other and, and the, the daughter getting a different hotel and being dragged and all of this drama surrounding R. Kelly. And they just kept giving him chance after chance after chance. So now they're in this situation with rocks, pebbles, tossing them two by two at, outside the, 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 the doggone studio. No help. No community, no nothing, just standing out there alone, hollering for their daughter into the night, no one listening, putting down the blinds, and continuing on. Meanwhile, goodness knows, the girls talk about degrading sex acts. And I used to read Donald Goyne's books. And they also mentioned in the series about the, about the, the pimpology. Listen, for those of you who don't know, go some read some of these books by pimps. Iceberg Slim wrote an amazing book. It was called The Pimp Bible, I believe. I Listen, you got a peak game. I read that when I was in my 20s, and that was like, oh, okay. And then it's so strange. I read that book, um, Alfred Bilbo's Goldson, I believe. I believe his name is Iceberg Slim. Alfred Bilbo's Goldson wrote these pimp books. And then I actually, I attracted a pimp into my life who I had the opportunity to speak to. And yes, you know what? The crazy part about it is, how do I say this? You know, when I was in my 20s, I met a guy who was a lawyer. And I used to be like, oh, don't get all lawyery on me, right? And it clicked for me. 
that there's some people who gravitate towards certain professions because it's just a part of who it is that they are. It's just how they communicate, how they process information, etc. Some people are really, really good at psychology. You know, some people, even with the degrees, are not. Pimps are very good at psychology. There are people who are able to calculate cause and effect and be able to, like there was a young lady who said she studies, I believe she said she studies body language or something like that. She said she came upon my video for the first time. She studies body language. I was intrigued to find out more about that. But there are people who understand how to get people to do certain things. And when you practice over the years like Kelly has practiced, you know how and what and exactly how to do it. Like some girls, enough was enough because he had hit them too soon. They hadn't been broken down enough. And there's some, so it's like knowing who the, the victim is going to be, choosing people who are more likely to go along with such and such. And so, you know, it's like so many people will be like, ah, that's why you ain't married, right? But you have to really take into account that every single person that we've come into, some people not being married may be a really good thing. You don't know what it is that they've navigated away from by choosing not to, to get or stay with certain people. My camera's moving. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, okay, you know what? There are some people who you're just not a good match for. Like that guy who told me he'd punched that girl in the face and how he was the victim and all of his stories. It was annoying to me. I'm like, how, how long are you going to tell me about how much you're being victimized yet you stay in this job, yet you chose this person and you chose that person? It was unattractive to me. But there are some people who can identify with it and they're like, oh, he didn't, these people did this. He didn't get a fair break. Oh my goodness, we've been talking for more than 30 minutes. You know what? Let me get out of here. Leave your comments below. I want to hear your thoughts about all of this, about your, about my commentary. Let's let's jump into the comments and I'll go back and forth with you down there, right? Tanya TKO and I am out. Next video will probably be a walking vlog and then I'll be back in Cali. So listen, I'll see you all later. Give me a hug. Hug, 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 hug. Yes, go out there and love one another, but most importantly, what? That's right, love yourself. Tanya TKO. And I'm out, please.